through uh, the introduction to Martinism. And this is part of a part five, a five part series we're gonna be doing on the history of the Martinist tradition. Um, part one was last month and that was, oh, do me a favor online guys and mute your microphone if you're not speaking, okay? And just unmute it to ask questions. That way we can reduce background noise. So, um, part one was last month, and that was basically a two-hour overview of the history of Martinism from the very first manifestation of the Yellow Cohen to the second manifestation of the CBCS, of Jean-Baptiste Willermose, the knightly tradition, to the third manifestation through Saint Martin and his writings. Um, thence, inspired by Saint Martin, Papu's Martinist Order of 1891. Uh, we traced it from that first Martinist Order through the Supreme Councils of the 1900s all the various splits, organizations, coming together, splitting apart, um, through the French Gnostic Church, as well as the late 1800s, and most recently into the formation of the OMS, and specifically what our great system is, what our curriculum is like, our lineages, et cetera, et cetera. All right? <clears throat> you guys doing all right over there? All right. You guys are still talking. Okay. So this one is going to be part two. We're going to focus uh, purely upon the Elo Cohen and Pasquale's heretical Masonic myth. Um, so bear with me. We're going to try to get through a lot of stuff today and see how this rolls out. Um, so just to recap real quick about our last conversation. What is Martinism? Martinism, in essence, is a Christian school of the Western esoteric mystery tradition that seeks to reawaken in, in its initiates the knowledge and experience of their own divine origins and powers so that we may once again, exist in the fullness of the divine immensity. That's a term that Pasquale uses for like the pleroma, the Gnostics, the fullness. This pursuit is undertaken not solely for the benefit of the individual, but for all of humanity and every spirit that suffers outside the pale of divine grace. So that is basically a fancy way of saying it is another mystery school to guide you towards the realization of the one truth, uh, to the realization of what mankind's origin is, uh, the knowledge of his fall from grace and his eventual reintegration back to that first primitive estate. Uh, the tradition commonly known as Martinism was born out of the 1700s French Freemasonic movement. It evolved through the three primary manifestations, which we'll explore in depth through each of these lectures. Again, the first one, Pasquale's Magical Cohen's. The second one, Willermo's and his RER CBCS, a Masonic knightly form of chivalry. Uh, Saint Martin, the unknown philosopher of his writings. And fourthly, Gerard and Coste, Dr. Papu, um, and the modern Martinist tradition. So this is, these are the three primary seals of the OMS, which you have the Elo Cohen on the left, the CBCS on the right, and the Voy Cardiac, the Way of the Heart, in the center. Um, a little bit about the OMS and where we come from. The OMS original tenets, uh, the OMS work is exemplified by the intentions of the founding members of the OMS. Number one, that Martinism exists for the sole purpose of the transmission of the light and is a vehicle for the gift of the royal secret, the stone of the philosophers, which dissolves and unites all mysteries of heaven and of earth. Number two, this gift carries within it the rights and burden of self-sovereignty. Number three, the OMS will make sovereignty and truth the core of its initiations, rituals, doctrine, and the order while staying true to the historical landmarks of Martinism. Number four, the Grand Council of SIs will develop and perpetuate Martinism in line with the principles above for its transmission in a new era. And lastly, if the order should ever cease to operate by the above principles, it shall be dissolved. Um, this is a tree outlining the basic grades of the OMS. We start at the bottom, our outer order. First degree Associate Elu, which is the traditional associate degree infused with Elo Cohen teachings. The second degree of Initiate Chevalier, which is the traditional initiate degree infused with CBCS teachings. And the third, the SI, which is the pure boy cardiac way of the heart of Saint Martin. Uh, at that point, the college is open, the CSI, College of Superior and Communes. Um, and this is entirely optional. If someone wishes to deepen their Martinist training, and take the traditional initiations of the Cohen, of the CBCS, of Rosicrucianism, they can open these paths up. Uh, the first thing they all get is what's called the Rose Claw, and it is a uh, 
transmission similar to like an etheric link is basically a transmission back to the original Rosicrucian traditions and it is extremely simple um, and straight to the point which is why we chose that as our primary RC transmission. Um, from there they can continue up that Rosicrucian train through the Frere d'Orient and eventually the ECAEC. Uh, we also have the CBCS, so all the degrees of the CBCS, the nightly tradition of Willemos, all the degrees of the yellow cone, which we're going to talk about today, and also the uh, minor and major orders of the Gnostic Church. Um, so about the college. The college um, brings together all these streams of Martinism. And here you guys that are seeing online, you can see uh, that is an example of some of the documents, some of the initiations that are given within uh, the college. Now, when we formed the OMS, and specifically when we formed any of these degrees, we took together all of the uh, extant histories, rituals, initiations, and documents, both from the 1700 originals, like French handwritten manuscripts, up through the 1800s, through the 1900s. And for every single degree, every single lecture, we laid them all out on the table. And here we have like 20 first degree initiations, 20 versions of it, 20 second degrees, et cetera, et cetera. We went through and cataloged each one to see all their similarities and all the differences. Um, and then from that perspective, from that bird's eye perspective, we sought to reconcile everything and bring it into what we consider the most complete version of the Martinist initiations. Um, for example, there are some orders out there that are still doing like six page rituals in their initiations where it's a very brief initiation, very Masonic, very little has to do with the myth, um, very little theurgy, if any. Um, we sought to rectify and bring together all the extant parts of the tradition into this one current of the OMS. Um, so here you guys can see, you know, can see here copies of original 1760s Elo Cohen certificates that we uh, were obtained through the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And we use these in order to build our OMS certificates, which are based entirely off of that. Um, likewise, we went through all these different versions that were out there, and then we discovered um, original handwritten documents that had never been translated into English. One of them is this one right here, uh, commonly called Le Manuscript d'Alger, but that's kind of a misnomer because there's two manuscripts that are called that. So we refer to them as Le Manuscript d'Alger, which is a 1770 manuscript, and also uh, Le Manuscript de Granville, uh, also sometimes called the Prunel Manuscript. And as an example of how we're trying to go back to the original root sources and not just use Ambalon's 1940s reconstructions, um, we are in the process, we're about 85% done of translating both of those. And you guys online can see this, these screenshots. Uh, it's going to end up being a one to three book series because it's about 1,300 pages. And this one right here is going to have the English translation, the French transcription, and a facsimile of the original French. So a complete resource for the next generation. So they don't have to do what we have to do. Um, and then the second one is going to be a full English translation and French transcription of that one as well. So, so whoever's on, can you uh, mute your microphone for us, please? So what we've done is now that we've translated these original 1700 manuscripts, we've gone back through our tone degrees and uh, revise them with anything that was not congruent with the original manuscripts. So we try to make everything streamlined as much as we can to the original sources. Um, here's one more example of how we've done that. Um, this is an example of source documents used to construct the Master Elo Cohen initiation, which you guys can't see right now, but it's 27 documents for that one initiation, 27 source documents. And they range from initiations of various orders to manuscripts such as Manuscript d'Alger, um, to the Elo Cohen registry and sigils of 2400 names. Um, again, we've tried to use as many resources as we can to give the most complete version of these transmissions. So let's talk a little bit about Martinez de Pasquale. Um, this is a recap from our last lecture. His full birth name is Jacques de Livron Joachim de la Tour de la Casa de Martinez de Pasquale. So say that 10 times fast. Um, yeah, those French guys. Um, his origins are rather, um, rather mysti mystified, and there's not one general consensus on when or where he was born. But most scholars at this point tend to place him as being born about 1727 in Grenoble, France, 
uh, perhaps of emigrated Spanish parents. Um, his family, some people think that his family were, uh, were Jews originally and converted to Christianity or the other way around. Um, we do know that French is not his strongest language. So the one document we do have from him in his handwriting, uh, well, probably Saint Martin's, uh, Reintegration of Beings, is written in like an almost broken French. It'd be like me writing a French document. It's like, makes sense, but it's kind of a little bit, kind of messed up. Um, so what we do have, right here you guys can see uh, the original Masonic patent that his father received. Freemasonry is much different back in the 1700s. Uh, the Grand Lodge system was in effect, but it was a very different system. It was much more loose, a lot more uh, free. And in 1738, um, there's this patent date in 1738, which is given to his father by Prince Charles Stuart, known as the Great Pretender, if you're familiar with uh, European history or Masonic history. And upon this document, he says, he declares himself King of Scotland, Ireland, and England, master of all the lodges spread over the surface of the earth. Um, this patent from Charles Stuart allowed Pasquale's father the right to constitute lodges, to make lodges and make masons. So it's kind of like a grand master certificate. Uh, it was also able to be bequeathed to his son. So Pasquale grew up in the tradition and inherited this and right off the bat was able to make lodges. So we see um, he arrived, he started really getting on the scene in France around 1754. And he founded the chapter Les Juges Ecossais, which means the Scottish Judges in Montpellier. Then in 1760, the first time we hear the word Cohen, he founded the Temple Cohen in Bordeaux. Um, 1764, he founded uh, La France Elu Ecossais, the French elect Scottish or Scottish elect, uh, which became recognized by the Grand Lodge of France, February 1st, 1765. So at this time, he's working within mainstream Freemasonry, within the Grand Lodge system. But already he is um, dissatisfied with the French high-grade uh, masonry, just like we'll see 130 years later with uh, the SRIA, with Kenneth Mackenzie, like we'll see uh, a few years later with the Hermetic Corps of the Golden Dawn, that they were dissatisfied with these Masonic high-grade systems that were pure theory with no practice and theurgy, no actual divine transmission or uh, self-transformation going on in the grades. So they found the SRIA and the Golden Dawn. What Pasquale did is he founded the Yellow Cone. Um, March 21st, 1767, Equinox, he founded the Sovereign Tribunal of the Yellow Cone. And this is basically the first Grand Council of Martinism. Uh, by 1770, the full name of the cone is L'Ordre des Chevaliers Maisons et le Coin de l'Univers, which means the Order of the Knights, Masons, Elect Priests of the Universe. It's a hell of a title. Not, not of France or Texas, but of the universe. Um, by then, they had temples in Bordeaux, Montpellier, Avignon, Foix, Le Bon, La Rochelle, Versailles, Paris, Metz, and Lyon. So they had 10 temples like that already. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Pasquale and how his system rolled out. First, we're going to talk about his number system. Okay? His tradition um, is very Kabbalistic, uh, Hermetic, Rosicrucian, Grimoric, and alchemical, but with his own angle to it, his own bend. Um, it is much more linked to Lyrian Kabbalah than it first appears. It's just that he uses his own terms, which you have to first identify in order to read his myths and understand it. Uh, for example, his Kabbalistic number theory is a bit different from the Lyrian Kabbalah we're familiar with. So you guys over there can see the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, and then uh, his universal table is basically kind of his version of the universe. So. The reintegration of beings, his primary document, the various circles of the yellow cone initiations, the batteries, the knots, um, the amount of candles in our temple, all come from, are all incomp incomprehensible without the knowledge of Pasquale's science of numbers. Um, it is unlike normal Kabbalah and has to be treated in its own level, in its own field. So uh, he says from reintegration of beings, quote, all laws of temporal creation and all divine acts are founded upon different numbers. Uh, much like, uh, who's that old Greek dude? Pythagoras, it's like Pythagoras and the idea of you know, everything is number. Uh, all numbers are co-eternal with the creator. They are eternal principles or ideas. 
It is through these different numbers that the Creator makes all forms appear and makes all his covenants with his creatures. Uh, he says that numbers are the secret divine spiritual patterns which contain and govern the whole universe. They represent the immutable laws of the eternal. It is the virtue of numbers which makes made the sages of all ages say that no man can become learned in things divine, spiritual, celestial, or particular, meaning the stars, the earth, and living beings, without the knowledge of numbers. So we're going to go through his ten numbers briefly, starting with one, the unity or the monad. The one in all systems represents the first principle of all being, the spiritual as well as temporal. He uses these terms, spiritual as um, uh, not even astral, but like transcendent. Temporal means matter or terrestrial. So number one represents the creator, the first principle. Number two, or the binary, he calls it the number of confusion, uh, which controls the association of the will of man with what he calls the demoniacal suggestion, the influence of the demon of the fallen spirits, which you'll see is very important to come. Um, the number two is said to be the cause of the fall and the operation of confusion. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. But number two basically is a binary. There's not a harmony between them. There's an opposite, an opposite, light and dark, two pillars. Then we have the three, or the ternary. This is the number of matter, okay, the triangle. Salt, sulfur, and mercury, the three alchemical elements, which he uses in a very unique way. Um, he calls them the spiritus essences of all forms. They're like the invisible um, animating force that creates all things. Um, he calls three the conjunction of intention with will and word, which begets divine action. So you got intention, will, word, now you have a triangle, and from those three comes the fourth of action, the manifestation. The four, the quaternary, this is the divine spiritual number used for the spiritual emanation of all living beings. Uh, he calls this the fourfold divine power. And you'll notice, you guys will see this in a moment online, but you notice in the table of the universe, the universal table, at the very bottom, there's a downward pointing triangle with the word yod with a four, so the lost word. Um, the origin is in matter. The first seed fell into matter and is still there, waiting to be rediscovered through the vitriol process. Now, the four he applies to what he calls the minor spirit, which is man, the number of Adam, the first Adam. Um, his treatise reaffirms that the minor is the last of the first, the fourfold emanation to proceed from God, who came into being as a consequence of the prevarication of the first three classes of spiritual beings, which will make sense in a moment. The spiritual, the major, and the inferior beings. Yet despite the fact that Adam's emanation occurred after the first three classes were emanated, Adam is still counted as the first among the first four classes. He is the one that governs over all the spiritual beings. Um, therefore, he was not affected by that first prevarication. And we'll get to that in a moment. Then we have the number five, the quinary. And in Pasquale's system, this is the number of the demoniacal spirits, of the demons. This is not dissimilar from the Lorianic Kabbalah, where the tree of life first shattered at five, at Gavura, at restriction. It could not contain the light and burst. So there's a similarity here. Um, number five is formed of the demons. When they wanted to add to the quaternary number, the number of their own emanation, which is an arbitrary unity. They tried to make themselves superior to deity and like deity. Then we have the number six, the centenary, which he calls the number of daily operations. This is literally the number of creation, the six thoughts of the six days of creation of Genesis. And you'll see this is extremely important um, in his system, as well as in the Hebrew Kabbalah. The six is the Ruach with the seventh in the center. Uh, then we have the seven, or the septenary, he calls this, just like the Bible, a number more perfect, more than perfect, which the Creator used to emanate all spirits out of his divine immensity. The divine immensity is the spot above. It is the eternity where God was everywhere before the Zimzum and the creation occurred. Um, this number seven relates to what he calls the inferior spirit, a power of the Holy Spirit. Um, this seven is a symbol for what he calls the good companion which in modern day terms, we all know the term HGA, Holy Guardian Angel. Um, he was basically doing the same thing 120 years before Golden Dawn, but he just called it the Good Companion. Um, it also represents the seven spiritual gifts and the seven principal spirits 
which were appointed to sustain creation. So you can call those the archons, perhaps, in Gnostic cosmology, or you could just call them the seven principles, like the Ruach again. Then we have eight, the octonary. This is the number of the divine double power. So it's the four plus the four. So the four power of the, of, uh, the minor, the quaternary power of God, the quadruple divine essence, doubled. Um, it is that power which was given to the first minor, to Adam, to triumph over the fallen spirits, the prevaricating spirits. The major spirit is uh, represented as a power of the sun. It is literally the number of Christ. Um, these are the powers which can act both upon the celestial, four above, and the terrestrial, the four below. Then we have the nine, or the nonary. nonary. Demoniacal, as the number of matter multiplied by itself. Number three, matter, three times three equals nine. Um, he has a lot of proofs you'll read in his texts and Sam Tam texts about why these numbers are what they are. One of them being for nine is that all numbers of nine theosophically are going to reduce back to nine. So three times three times three, three times itself equals 27. Two plus seven equals nine, right? 27 times nine equals 243. Two plus four plus three equals nine. So he just goes on for like pages and pages crap like that. Then we have the ten. So we're coming back to the end, to the beginning. The ten or the denary. This is the divine number. It is the number one inscribed in a circle. One, zero. Uh, it is called the superior spirit or a manifestation of a pure, good, and true facet of the countenance of the eternal. So this is the eternal in his capacity as the father. Um, the number ten contains the first nine numbers. And Pasquale says that no minor, no man, and I'm saying man, this is non-gender specific. Okay, this is about Adam Cadmon before gender splits. No minor can become a sage without a perfect knowledge of that great denary number of the, of the eternal and of its content of emancipation and creation. Uh, ten relates in the Cohen mythology to the ten patriarchs of Israel and the ten elected minors, or what he calls the ten... Uh, precursors of Christ, which we're going to talk about. So just to sum it up again, one is God. Two is uh, confusion, right? Separation, binary. Three is the number of matter, salt, sulfur, and mercury, that which animates all things. Four is the quadruple divine essence, symbolized sometimes by yod um, Five is a demoniacal number, representing the demons trying to uh, force themselves over the minor, the four. Six represents the six thoughts, the six days of creation. Seven represents the perfection and uh, the Holy Spirit, the HGA. Eight represents the double divine power, so the Christ. Nine represents demons, matter multiplied by itself. Ten represents deity and its eternal, uh, paternal aspect. Um, you guys can see here, this is uh, two screenshots from Pasquale's registry of 2,400 names and his collection of hieroglyphs. Um, we were blessed to be able to find two copies of this. Um, Pasquale would have, he had this original manuscript that he created, which is a hell of a thing. People try to figure out where it came from. There's a book by Gil Lapat, it's in French, unfortunately. It's called uh, Les Écritures Magiques. And he goes through trying to analyze this book and figure out where it came from. It's composed of 2,400 Sigils, but it's actually like 2,596. It's not actually 2,400, that's just a, con a convenient number. Um, four, I'm sorry, 4,576 sigils. A lot more than 2,400. Um, divided into 208 sigils for each letter of the alphabet, excepting J, W, X, Y, he's using Hebrew alphabet, uh, making a total of 22 letters as in the Hebrew alphabet. Each set of 208 sigils is divided into 100 numbered characters and 100 hieroglyphs, each with an additional four sigils, which are unnumbered. Now, these sigils match up with the registry of 2,400 names, which um, actually is more than 2,400 names, again. But what you would use this for is, this is basically like, it's been called the Ilocon phone book, is that uh, when you're doing your operations, when you're in the lower grades, the master would give you a spirit to work with. And uh, you'd get a name and a hieroglyph. You're supposed to work with that and obtain what he called passes. And that literally means you're in the temple meditating, you should see something fly before you. 
something moves, something pass before you. Whether it's a sigil, a light, a color, a name, a word, a vision, um, some kind of a manifestation of the spirit. Um, this registry is one thing that you could use to check your spirits. You could see if the spirit you, you saw correlates to the spirit you're supposed to be seeing. Um, or in the more advanced workings, uh, you'd have the book yourself and you'd select certain spirits uh, for your operations. Now that number system we just described is how that book is classified. So in the names, you're gonna see next to each one of them a one or a two or a three, et cetera, et cetera. And that tells you what kind of a spirit it is, as well as what planet rules it, if there's an element that rules it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in the advanced workings, you pick your own spirits and work with them to do uh, various exorcisms and purifications of the world. Um, now, this was given only at Rho Quadigree, the highest degree of the order. And Pasquale made this. Gil Lepop tries to figure out where they came from. He took the uh, sigils of all the grimoires of Renaissance medieval times. He took uh, magical alphabets of the Hebrews, of uh, the Chinese, Japanese, um, Chaldean, all different kinds of pictographs, and then categorized them in tables. And he's able to find about maybe like a third of the sigils. So there is a link in history to these sigils. But then the rest of them, he's like, I don't know, Pasquale found them on his own by inspiration. And uh, for sure, his classification system is entirely revolutionary. Uh, no one has done anything like that before or since, especially in the scale that he's done that. So we were blessed in order to find uh, two versions of that. Pascal would give that out uh, as a manuscript at the Rogue Quad grade, just like in the old Golden Dawn, you'd get a manuscript and copy by hand. And we have both Sam Martin's handwritten version and Prunel de Lier's handwritten version, which we give to our members for 20 bucks. And we have two ROs that start to take your we believe are ways of being able to actually crack those. Yes, yes. Because there is a pattern of both sides that don't use statistics. Yes. Um, uh, one of our attendees here said that uh, one of the work of the college right now is to decipher this text um, in ways that, and be, be creative with it, try to crack its codes uh, and find new keys within it. Um, and there's a new document I have that really helps us with that. So now let's talk about the myth itself. Okay, so the Martinus myth is the core of the tradition, and whether you're talking Elo Cohen, CBCS, or the Boy Cardiac, they all meet around the central Martinist myth. Um, and we'll talk about how that developed afterwards, um, how, how it was perpetuated by his students in different ways. But the Martinist myth is uh, our tradition's secret esoteric Christian narrative that is disseminated through our initiations and our secret texts. The myth has an unknown origin, although it has many similarities with the Coptic, Hermetic, pre-Christian, Judaic, Kabbalistic, Valentinian, and Sethian narratives. Um, as well as obviously that of like Isaac Luria. The myth in the version that we use was first told by Pasquale and then retold by San Martin and Willermose in their own ways. The myth itself, its core is still the same, however. Um, however, we believe that in order to be kept alive, it must be rewritten by all Martinists. So in the OMS, there's a phase where you actually have to write your own myth um, to show that you are not just regurgitating what we give you, that you're actually integrating it processing it, and then you can write your own version of it that reflects your life, your processes, to pass on to the next generation. Um, so we all go through the same rituals, read the same texts, reach the same or similar conclusions, but how we relate to these in our lives is very individual. Um, the myths can be said to serve three purposes in our work, redemptive, instructive, and ritualistic. Redemptive in the sense that it is a mystical narrative it aims to reveal an understanding, which it does to us by manifesting the myth and us living it in our daily lives. By reading between those lines, we can find the message between the words used, and its true message begins to come clear to us. Um, it is instructive. It describes and discusses the spiritual, psychological, and magical aspects of being in an intuitive and dramatic way, uh, instead of just structured and intellectual. It is ritualistic. It describes a dramatic narrative a sequence of events and a method of action, not just philosophy, not just passive listening, but action you must take in your myth in order to achieve the next stages. Um, combined with the initiations of any of the branches, this um, 
brings us to this uh, through our personal work, through the initiations, and especially in the yellow cone. The yellow cone uses the most pure form of it. Um, helps us bring that myth deeper into ourselves so we can integrate it. Um, so we're going to go through this, the myth. Uh, depending on what time we have, I have three versions we can give you just to show how it can be fluid. We'll see how we go in time, though. So the myth in four quick stages. Number one, the eternal. Number two, the fall. Number three, the exile. Number four, reintegration. So um, number one, the eternal. God before time, before creation, and how all came to be. So in this diagram, you guys see you have an image of the tree of life in 10 successive spheres. Now you can imagine that, or in here we can see up here, the divine immensity, okay? An infinite space in which God is everything, God is in everything. There's nothing that is not God. So you could say, does it even exist? Does it not exist? Is there no beginning, no end? Just pure deity. Um, common with the traditional Lorianic Kabbalah, in order for there to be creation, God had to create a space where he did not exist. So in Lorianic, they call this the Zimzum, which can be imagined as a, an inhalation. So you can imagine that if deity is everywhere, he inhales, creates a space, a void in which he is not, so that the exhale can happen, the Ruach Elohim, the Ruach HaKadosh, can breathe upon the face of the waters and create manifestation. Yes, the vertical. So you have a circular, what's called a circular, and linear. Mm -hmm. So, and they act in two different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our attendees was pointing out that that diagram you're looking at, it's ten spheres, and you'll see down the center there's a line. So it's showing the tree of life in two different ways, circular and linear. And uh, you'll notice that on the very outside, we have um, Ein Sof Or. Right? Then you have Keter, Hakma, Bina. You have one through ten going in. You can also see it as in the center is the one going out to the ten on the outside. Um, this is illustrating that lesson that Keter is in Malkut and Malkut is in Keter. The eternal is in matter, the matter is in the eternal. Um, then we have the fall. So man, Adam Kadmon's shattering and fall into the sea of unknowing and forgetfulness. This has been symbolized in the Old Testament as the uh, exile from the Garden of Eden, and this will be uh, given to us in a dramatic way in just a moment through Martinism. We have the exile, the state of man and the universe as it is today, and our way back to which we were. So the exile, man now, mankind um, ignorant of their own nature, mankind ignorant of the divine truth and the secrets. Then we have four, the reintegration, the final salvation, and disintegration of the non-real. This doctrine, when compared to other myths and ideologies, can be said to be one of emanation. So Pasquale doesn't call his mythology creation, because creation has a beginning and an end. He calls it emanation, that from the spirit of deity, he emanated out what we now call creation, but he emanated out being. Creation, physical creation, didn't happen until a few steps later in the myth. And that is the matter as we know it. So that's an overview. Now we're going to look at another overview in 10 stages and go to, into it in depth. First stage, the eternal dwells in its own being. Perfect rest. Two, the eternal is reflected in his own mind, will, action, and being. So now the four powers, which you'll see on this table right here. There's the eternal, and then emanates four. Okay. Which is the, four, the first four emanations. And this is in what he calls the immensity sur celeste, the super celestial immensity, which, for lack of a better term, would be like the heaven of heaven, the transcendent, um, like maybe Bria or absolute, whereas the divine immensity would be more like the Ain Sophor, the, un, the un, uh, uncomprehensible. Now, these four luminaries emanate four beings. This is the spiritual the major, the inferior, and the minor beings. Um, then man is emanated out of the eternal. He is emanated in the midst as the crown of these first three classes of spiritual beings, meant to be their ruler, their guide. What's up, little kid? 
<laughs> meant to be their ruler and guide. Now, this is where the problem happens. Those first beings, everything was created with free will. And free will means that there's absolute free will. There's no limit. They can do right or wrong. They can follow the, the law, precepts, commandments, those first three powers of the eternal. Or they can do their own thing. Those first beings want to become creators themselves and thus fall, become trapped in the void. Um, when this happened, well, we'll get to that. Then man, Adam Kadmon, is charged with what is called the reintegration of the fallen beings. As the miner, as the crown of creation, he is charged to go into matter, to go into the void, not matter yet, into the void, and turn those spirits back to the light, to raise the demons, to raise the prevaricated spirits. But man screws up. Man um, is then persuaded by the fallen spirits to become a creator himself. No, not emanator, a creator. This causes the creation of physical matter. So in Pasquale's myth, man created matter, not God. Um, causes the physical creation of matter in the void, and man becomes trapped therein together with the fallen beings. You'll see this in the old hermetic texts, or the alchemical texts that say that uh, because of the fall, man has dragged the chain of the elements behind him. That could be the fallen spirits, the, the forms of matter that he's now entrapped with. Um, the next stage, Christ is emanated from the eternal to redeem man. Christ comes down and takes the place that Adam Kadmon left. He takes that position that Adam Kadmon failed to fulfill. Um, through Christ, he, he doesn't fail. <laughs> he doesn't accomplish it. The universe is dissolved, the material creation, and then all is re reintegrated back to the fullness, the pleroma, the divine immensity. Okay, now we're going to go into those a little deeper, okay? Any questions? I'm trying to go pretty quick, huh? Got a lot of materials. Okay, I'm going to check on these guys real quick, see how they're doing. See if there's any questions from the peanut gallery. Can see you. Okay, looks like they're good. So, stage one, the eternal dwells in its own being. The tradition tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Through him, all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and this life was the light of man. And the light shineth in the darkness, but that darkness comprehended it not. The eternal exists before time in all creation in perfect stillness. Its existence is one, infinite and perfect, resting within itself in the not being, beyond all understanding and all contemplation. This state of being in our tradition is referred to as lamensite, the immensity. It's a term he tries to use to describe just the incomprehensible immensity of deity. Um, you'll see this described in Gnostic terms as the pleroma, or the fullness. Now, in order to experience itself, the eternal mirrors itself in mind, will, action, and being. The first original four properties, a fullness of four luminaries, which we have right here. The eternal casts a silent echo into the fullness, like that. And thus the eternal emerges from its non-existence as a unity that the mind can now conceive. It is closed to the unity with four properties, mind, will, action, and being. Pasquale calls this the quadruple divine essence, a very clumsy, inelegant word, but uh, it points to a mystery about existence in unity. There are three lights, mind, will, action, all of which refer to a common source, which is greater and more perfect than the sum of those three. We can also call these the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or in Freemasonry, wisdom, strength, and beauty, which conceive, support, and adorn the universe. Um, Pasquale sometimes called them the Eternal, the Father, the Christ, the Son, and Wisdom, or Sophia, the Holy Spirit. These four luminaries emanate four beings, so the four principles, mind, will, action, being, then emanate four beings, uh, which are now distinct from himself. They have a free, independent movement. 
these three types of beings can also be called states of being or orders of angels, states of consciousness, orders of angels, who have their source in those four properties and carry it within themselves. So they're all looking at a diagram of Yodhya Bhante, one circle with four circles interconnected. Um, these spiritual beings are above all archangels, angels, choirs of angels. Those came later. Uh, they have many names, but they are known within Martinism as the superior beings, power of the ten, the divine eternal. They represent the thought of the eternal and the wisdom. The major beings, the power of the eight, the Christ, which uh, represents the principle of will and strength. The inferior beings, seven, which represents action or the good companion, the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that is beauty. Um, they were all emanated simultaneously. Before the fourth of them, who would reign over them from their midst in the image of the eternal own being. They were distinct from the eternal, not in essence, because he is within them, but their being and appearance, as they have free will, and they act and operate independently of each other and their source. So they carry the eternal, but they can go and do as they will. The fourth stage, man is emanated out of the eternal, from the midst of the fullness, in the fullness's own image. You know, um, as Genesis says, uh, okay, 110, she, she, it's like the line. And the Elohim said, let us make Adam in our image and after our own likeness. Um, and let them have dominion over the fish of the air and the fowl of the, you know, the, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over all the cattle of the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And the Elohim created et ha Adam, spirit of Adam. In the image of the Elohim created they then, male and female created they then. This is the fourth spoke of. So man was emanated in the image of deity and carries a fullness within himself as the fourth reflection of the light, so that fourth minor power, and the eternal innermost essence. He was emanated to complete the heavenly fullness and in order to emanate more beings like himself, man the minor. They see an image of the Vitruvian man, which is the man that squares the circle. Uh, tradition tells us that man was and is the crown of creation. This is not the material or temporal man of creation, bound by the chains of time and space, but a spiritual being untouched by such limitations, because his creation took place in a region where there was no time, and thus was the offspring of a generation of such a kind that had cannot be found in the temporal, in matter. He was born of the heavenly kingdom, emanated out of the threefold and fourfold light, we name these three lights different things, again, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which our masters call the divine mind, the divine will, the divine action, wisdom, strength, and beauty. Yes, 10, 8, and 7. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is uh, these first creatures, in their freedom, and in the heart of its own being, conceived a desire to be the origin of his own states of being. Um, oh, we just say it. His being is referred to as the opponent, or Satan. He was not emanated to multiply, but to support the fourth being in its extent. Unable to emanate out of itself, and thereby pass on the image of the eternal in the fullness, he decides, therefore, to become a creator. Uh, because of his free will, he's free to do so, even if it violates his own nature and essence. At that same moment that he conceives a mental picture of how to do this, immediately a distorted picture of the fullness is created, a meaningless emptiness. This has never before existed, as the all has now been in everything, and everything has been in the all. In the confusion of what he's just done, this being, this opponent, has fear, shame, distrust, which uh, Crowley, well, not even Crowley, let's say the, the Gnostic fathers of the the Greek fathers of the Philoclea would say that the evidence of sin is shame. Um, so now he begins to try to hide his what he did from the eternal. Um, he ends up trying to create a war against heaven. And in this, these original four properties now get perverted into what the tradition will call the four uh, king demons, the four uh, archdemons of the universe, Satan Bara, the false creator, the original lie, perverted thought, so the ten power, 
Belphegor, empty desires. Perverted will, the perverted eight. Beelzebub, Beelzebub. decay, uh, the perverted action, so the perverted seven. And then Leviathan, fate, the perverted being. Man receives his mission now to reintegrate these fallen beings. Man is thus sent out from his home in the midst of the fullness to persuade Satan and the fallen states to return, to reintegrate that part of the eternal which maintains the disturbance in the fullness. Here's a quote from Saint Martin. My birthright outshines all glory. The inner light turns all other light unto night. My light you shall bear. Where falsehood has gained power, and over all radiant aspects, over all radiate aspects of my glory. Then I have set a regent over the air itself, the holder of the office that shall rule, and I have sent is you, that I have issued over the corruption itself. O man, by thine own power from the blue sky, do you strike low upon the earth and upon the swarm of the primal darkness, and with the same stroke return to my heaven. The tradition says that man is noble. He hails from the supreme king, created in his image and dressed in a royal costume, clothed in an impenetrable armor because it was of unity and simplicity, and because of its origin in the divine principle, imperishable. The force of the mixed bodies, matter, had no effect on it. Man thus moved to the outer edge of the fullness, and because of its, and stood between it and the emptiness. Now, man's hanging out with Satan and trying to you know, tell him to come back. But he gets persuaded to become a creator himself. And he gives the thing that they didn't have. He had the image of the Father within him. So he was able to animate the fallen. In that same instant, physical matter is created within the emptiness. And man is trapped together with the fallen beings. You can liken this to the uh, tale of Narcissus in uh, the Greek mythologies that a uh, man fell in love with his own reflection and in an ecstasy desired to be a part of it. And right when he saw himself in that waters, boom, fell into it, right? Um, you see this mythology reflected throughout all the mythologies of creation, um, just in their own different proclivities. So as he does this, man's image of himself becomes distorted and he crashes into the nothingness and is split into two. Eve is torn from Adam. The whole becomes two opposites, confusion. And we're back to there now. Both incomplete, and thus is matter form that man is incarnated into. The four regions, those four perverted principles, launch themselves at man. Satan attacking the shattered and confused creature in fear that he himself, now that his opponent is with him in his prison, would be, would be toppled from his throne. So one of the mythologies of the yellow cones is that these fallen spirits are always talking to us. They're always in our ears. There's good spirits, there's bad spirits that influence man to, uh, to uh, take action. And we'll see how they deal with that initiations a little bit later. But basically, he got convinced to do wrong, and to go against the eternal. And we're left in exile. The original state is no more. And it's pretty obvious, you look around this world, how messed up things can be, right? How we are estranged from our own nature, how we are ignorant of who we are, what we are. We are separated from each other. We are uh, bound by matter, by time, by decay. Um, we don't control our own thoughts. We can't control time and the decay of our bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're torn between reason and emotion, will and aspiration, consideration and selfishness. So the tradition says that when man repeated his opponent's act of creation, this was the second transgression, he plunged himself into his own grave, the same prison that Satan should have been wrapped in. Then we have step eight. The Christ has emanated from the eternal to redeem man. So a new spirit, the eight, the Christ, was put in a position man once held. This is what we know, this being is what we know as the word who was in the beginning, Christ, the redeemer. Yeshua, the repairer, all names of the same power and force known by many veils amongst the world's traditions. And we should note that we are, this is a Judeo-Christian narrative, but it does not need to be taken literally. We're not necessarily talking about Jesus of Nazareth. 
We're talking about a principle of the Christ, which you'll see uh, Pascoli talks about having come many times through history. His work is not to force man to his knees, as man was to drive back the darkness, but rather to be a man's light and his staff in the darkness, the lamp of occult wisdom that goes before him, though he sees it not, and lead him back to the fullness through his example. Christ is therefore the mediator between God and man in his present condition. Samaritan, quote from him, man's purpose on earth is to use his whole being and all his forces to the greatest extent possible to eliminate that which lies between the self and the true son so that it practically without any resistance can become a free passageway and the rays of light can reach it without fragmenting. Now, the tradition says that when this is accomplished, when man begins to recognize his own image again, he starts his journey back to the fullness. The myth says it happens through four major upheavals. First, the resolution of Satanbara's illusion of what the true origin is, so discovering what you are, where you come from. Number two, the resolution of Leviathan's meaningless cycles. Three, the resolution of Beelzebub's transience, changeless, you know, uh, changefulness. Four, the resolution of Belphegor's longing for the empty. When this is accomplished, the, the opponent begins to dissolve, and what many religions consider to be the cataclysmic end of times, when everything comes to an end, occurs. Corruption disappears, dissolution is dissolved, death dies, and from the ashes arise the eternal life universal reintegration. Now, it should be said that this should not be taken literally, okay? You can look around and see how some uh, spurious organizations, uh, such as maybe the Bilderbergs, have taken this literally and tried to actually like create an apocalypse in uh, the macrocosm. I don't think that's what's happening here. You can, anyone who's gone through this process can tell you this is an actual microcosmic process that you'll experience. Um, and all these are, are guideposts and you will go through it in your own way. But this is a microcosmic experience that um, we should be very careful to apply it to the macrocosm. So, number 10, everything is reintegrated back to the fullness. Reintegration is the great work of the alchemists, the Masonic royal art, and Christianity's eternal birth. All right, questions before we keep going. That was a little middle part. Uh, you fell. So we're going to talk a little bit about the cosmology, which will help to describe some of that. And you guys online are seeing this diagram. They, they are seeing before you the universal table. According to the doctrine of Martinez de Pasquale, the vastness is divided into three parts. This version you guys are seeing is, I think that, I think this is Sam Martin's handwriting. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I think that's Sam Rattan's version. We also have Pernell DeLear's version. We also have Willard Moses' handwritten versions. And then you guys will see later a nice English version so you can read it. Um, it is similar to the Kabbalist Tree of Life, but very different. So we have the divine immensity, deity. Now, you can tell this looks like a Taurus glyph, right? Interesting. So we have the divine immensity. We have the circle of the denier of circles, so the, the ten circle. The divine as the father, which is also number one, the divine spirit, the first. He emanates the super celestial immensity, which you all will see is the big circle underneath that uh, crescent moon at the top. This is the uh, heaven of heavens. From there, we have these three that come down, one, two, three, four. These are the circle of the major spirits, the eight, the circle of the inferior spirits, and the circle of the minors. Okay, These are those four original lights, four original properties. And then right here, that second big circle, this one right here, which looks like a million faces or tongues of flame, is what he calls the central fire axis. And that is said to be like the, the spirit that animates all things, the central fire axis. You can, it's not exactly equivalent, but you can kind of think of it as like the secret fire, perhaps. Ishmael. Yes, thank you. That's good. Your, your 
Uh, well, these act, there's some differences in this too. You'll, you'll compare the three of them and they'll do something differently. This one says uh, 843, but you'll also see 874. So 10874. That's probably more proper than the three there. Then we come down and we have, these are the circles we're used to. These, this is the Ruach, essentially, right in here. So different circles coming in. Central fire axis surrounding and penetrating all. Then you have this second inner circle where you guys can see Saturn start. This is called the immensity celeste, so the celestial immensity. Um, you can think of that as the solar system if we're looking physically. So we have Saturn, the Sun, Mercury. It's, now it breaks that system, it doesn't use the same thing. Um, Saturn, Sun, Mercury, Mars, and then Jupiter, the Moon, Venus. And from all of these, in the very bottom, the form terrestrial, the immensity terrestrial, the terrestrial immensity, Earth, matter, physical incarnation, you have a downward pointing triangle, which if you've ever taken initiation in the OMS, you know where that is. You've seen it. Uh, this is the key. And in that, you have the Om Terrestrial, the terrestrial soul, the soul trapped within the earth, vitriol, like in the Splendor Solus, that image of uh, little gnome guys going into the earth to find the hidden stone. In there is four, your Hibata. Yeah. So, the celestial, the heavenly, the terrestrial. And here's another version for them to see. Uh, I can just show it to you. God, the four original powers, which reflects itself into the uh, super celestial. Prevarication occurs, the fall, and I'll just have to show it to you. It's kind of hard to describe. Right here, you're seeing a circular version and linear. We also have a linear version you can see, which is in your Associate Elliot handbook. And then through this, in these four circles, is matter created. And we have the central axis of uncreated fire, the rational circle of time, so Saturn creates time. Then we have the visual circle of time, that's the sun, vision. Then we have the sensible circle of time, so that's with Earth, the body. And I think we'll just skip this part. We don't need to go through all that. <clears throat> now, in this bottom triangle, you can't see it in here, but you'll see it in other diagrams and your first degree handbooks, that this triangle is composed of the three original properties of salt, sulfur, and mercury. Mercury, in his system, represents the earth. A little different. Salt is the water. I mean, I guess salt is the water. And then sulfur is obviously the fire. And then the fourth component, the central fire axis, is that which uh, the uncreated fire, is that which binds everything together of those three principles and animates them. Okay, so we're going to go through the myth one more time in a little different way, now from reintegration beings itself. Um, this is a very difficult text to comprehend, first of all because it's kind of written in really bad French. Um, there are three English versions out there. There's the one you can get online, which looks like a scan of a scan of a scan. It's about 100 pages. Uh, Amork published it uh, in the early 1900s. That's a good like beginner text because it's, it's it's like the most simple version of it. Then there is uh, Trev Trevor Travis Trevor what's his name Trevor Wallace no that's a different guy <laughs> Trevor something the blue version um, by Septeptrion Books that version uh, is really a pretty terrible translation and then there's a new version by Campenhout which is out of print unfortunately it came out of Canada but we have digitals we give to our members. Um, that version is, instead of being 100 pages, it's 340 pages and annotated extensively so that all the difficult terms are now described. So you're like, oh, that's what quadruple divine essence means. Weird word. So in Reingridish Beings, you see, 115. We're going to flip through this pretty quick. We're going to skip a lot of it. We have creation. You know, let's just start. Everything is in God. God emanates the three, thought, will, and action. The four comes. You know, I think I'm actually going to skip this. We'll just go through. There is the first creation. There's the first emanation of those three spirits with the fourth of man. 
the first transgression, the first prevarication is those spirits that decide to rebel against God and try to be their own creator. Man comes with the purpose, he was called the Ro, or the red man, which you'll see in alchemy and Kabbalah, the exact same term. Um, Adam Kadmon, he was emanated to bring those spirits back to the light. He failed. That was the second transgression, the second prevarication. Um, the generations of Adam, so this is very important in the Pasquale myth, is that you start to have what he calls types. Types are um, uh, classifications, beings, models, archetypes of a principle. So after the reconciliation, uh, now each one of these fallen spirits would have what's called a reconciliation. So Adam has a reconciliation uh, with the divine. He had the severe penalty of being uh, cast out of the Garden of Eden. But then when Adam repented before the divine, he reconciled with him, but still gave him a lower power than that which he possessed before his crime. So you're going to see through the myth a fall of every single one of these types, their reconciliation. A fall, their reconciliation. Um, waiting until that final reintegration that only comes through the Christ. So generations of Adam, they were commanded to grow and multiply. Uh, now they have bodily passion, physical uh, coitus, and create beings. Uh, the first, then there is the son of Cain. There's the son Cain, son of my sorrow, is how he interprets it. By the way, his Hebrew is really messed up. So he'll say this is what it means, and you'll be like, what? You just, you just gotta go with it. Okay, go with his bad 1700s Hebrew. And his sister, Cani, the children of confusion, and Abak, on children. This was Adam's first posterity. He says he had three children first, Cain, Cani, and Abak. Then after a six-year interval, Adam and Eve had four other children. So you see it's very heretical already. Like, this didn't happen in the Bible. Um, the eldest was called Abba, the son of peace, which was like a man-god on the earth. Um, we also know him as Abel. Um, he behaved like Adam was supposed to behave. He worshipped the creator with the type of, creation, type of worship he wanted. So he is now the second type of Adam, the second version of Adam Kadmon. But, you know, Cain and Abel started fighting. Um, carried away by hatred, Cain killed Abel, piercing first his throat, then his heart, then his entrails. And Abel died. Um, this becomes very important in the first degree of the initiation of the Elkhorn. Uh, Cain was therefore punished, and uh, he founded the city of Henoch. His first son was Enoch, the second Tubal Cain. And then, as for Adam, he was reconciled by the Eternal in the death of Abel. He then therefore conceived Seth, which Pasquale says means allowed the seed of God, who inherited all the gifts of Abel and was directly instructed by Heli which is the spiritual scent of God. Heli is what he calls a third type of Adam. It's a word he uses for the Christ. So we're going to see all these falls happen. You're going to see uh, create, uh, birth happen, then do something stupid, then get reconciled again, and sometimes fall back in. This man just doesn't learn his lesson. So at this point, we have two mixes of humanity. We have the sons of Cain and the sons of Seth. The former, Cain, has useful arts, but the Lord lets them wander in darkness. You know, these are the, the, the metalsmiths. Then we have the sons of Seth, uh, who go towards reconciliation. This, eventually the sons of Seth become the line of Aaron in this mythology. Um, this reconciliation lasts for only so long. Occasionally, an elected minor, a forebeing, will appear, which will transmit the instructions of the creator to mankind. These elected minors are thinking. They have that power of thought of the eternal, directly emanated from the vine, the divine, and will incarnate in the form of different posterities of Adam. These elected minors are said to be ten in number: Abel, Enoch, Noah, Melchizedek, the first one to do the Eucharist, Yosef, Moses, David, Solomon, Zerubbabel, and the Messiah. So. I think that is probably a good way we could just summarize it without getting too deep in the rest of it. So there are these ten types of the Christ, ten types of the minor. We got Moses. There's a big part about him in the reintegration of beings, as well as in the eighth degree of the Cohen. 
So here's an interesting part. He goes up to Mount Sinai, who Pasquale says means height of elevation, divine glory. <laughs> Comes down 40 days later with the tablets of the law engraved by the Spirit of the Lord. But when he came down, he saw the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. And he sees that Israel just transgressed. He breaks the tablets of the law and chooses 15 elected from the tribe of Levi, who with their daggers spent killing 3,000 men in the camp as a sacrifice to deity to reconcile. It's like, you guys screwed up, time to die. You know, very Old Testament. Um, thus the camp of Israel was purified, and the Israelites gained favor with the Lord. So this construction of the golden calf, he shows, is a repeat of Adam's sin, a type of that transgression, where through pride, he created a bodily form. He created his own thing to worship, the golden calf, which becomes his prison. So these kinds of illusions come back again and again. Um, the tabernacle, when Moses builds that, it's said to represent this, the uh, universal table. Inside the tent, you have the super celestial, celestial world. The heavenly world are the four doors to enter the tabernacle. The terrestrial world is that which is outside the tabernacle. And then you have the human body itself. Um, the four doors of the tabernacle, the door of the east is said to be that of the heart, the door of the west, that of the eye, the south gate of the mouth, the north gate of the ear. And anyone who knows uh, Martin's signs will recognize those. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the grades of the Kohen um, slightly in depth. And I want to give a preamble here um, that everything we're speaking about today and all these lectures is nothing that you can't find out with a little bit of research. Um, there have been one or two individuals in the internet who have gotten upset that we are giving secrets away. But uh, anyone who's done some basic research on modernism, who has uh, read the texts that have been published for the last hundred years, from Papu to René Lacoustier, Robert Amadou, Robert Ambalon, Serge Caillé, these are all out there. All we're doing is bringing it together, making it comprehensible. So uh, anything we show, including regalia, a couple of circles will show, is nothing that you can't find out there. We are not giving away any secrets of passwords, any uh, things that will ruin the initiatory process. We're just giving people quality information because there's too many people out there claiming to be teaching this that don't know what they're talking about or are giving bad misinformation. Okay? So, what you see here is one version of the Elocone grade system. There are two or three primary versions from the 1700s because Pascal was making the system as he was initiating into it. So things changed. In modern days, you'll see several different versions of these grades. Um, essentially, you can either say there's seven classes or five classes or four classes. Uh, let's say the first set is what's called regular Freemasonry, St. John's Masonry. Um, he built his system on Freemasonry. First degree apprentice, second degree companion, third degree master. He specified these as symbolic not magical, symbolic masonry. And originally you had to be a master mason to come out of the Yellow Cohen. That changed. They were initiating women in the 1700s. Willard Moses' sister, for example. She became a roquois. Um, when you'd come into the Cohen, you'd go through those first three degrees again, but in an occult, magical, elevated way that would show you the inner teachings behind masonry and link it to the myth. And then you have your second class, the porch class. You could say this is the fourth to seventh degrees, which you do all at one time. It's a very long ritual. You go through four stages of it. Particular master, sometimes called Maitre Lu. Apprentice Cohen, now we have the Cohen grades, the priest grades. Companion Cohen, master elect Cohen, master Elu Cohen. And that's when you start to truly do ceremony and magic. Uh, then you have the temple class, eighth degree of Grand Master Cohen, uh, which is also called Grand Architect. Ninth degree, Grand Elu of Zerubbabel. Uh, this has two or three subgrades, depending on how you look at it. It can be called the Knight of the Orient, Chevalier d'Orient, Commander of the Orient, and also Apprentice Roquois. And we'll describe how we use that in a little bit. Then you have the last, the Sanctuary, which is the Roquois degree. So this could be said, just like almost every initiatory system, it starts at the porch of the tabernacle, and you go through the Parvis, into the temple, into the Sanctuary of the Holy of Holies. Just about every system does this. So you start at the porch, go to the sanctuary. So the first set of classes is called the first election of Adam and the blue band. 
and literally you have a blue sash that you receive in that degree. Um, over here you can see an example of the French right. This is what the federal, the worship master of the first four degrees wears. And it is a simple French right master mason's apron, which uh, that is actually the password of the master mason in everywhere except America. <laughs> They're the ones that don't use it. And uh, a simple blue ape, blue collar, bunch of skulls. So this degree has, in the yellow Cohen, your initiations take place in magical circles, very much like the old Grimoire traditions. This degree has six circles around it, which represent the six thoughts of the eternal, the six days of creation, um, veiled by Moses in the book of Genesis as the image of six days. A quote from the initiation, put this man in the care of the brothers of the tribunal to retrace what happened at the beginning of time in the center of the universe. So in this initiation, you literally go through creation and you get birthed from the divine immensity in a very dramatic, uh, ritualistic way like we were talking about the myth does. So not only is it intellectual, not only is it um, a story, you live it, you go through it to integrate these principles. Um, that degree, the way that we do it, can be said to have uh, three or four parts. Uh, the apprentice, the companion, the master. Apprentice, you're born in the eternal, right? Second degree, companion, the fall. And uh, in certain versions of the Cohen, certain organizations, you literally get tortured in that degree. We've decided you can do that without physically harming someone. Um, third degree, you have the beginning of your reconciliation. And you start to get your commandments to do your work, to come back to the light. Um, you'll see this done in two primary ways. The oldest versions of the rituals, like the handwritten versions we have, show uh, that in the second degree, you will basically retake the oaths of apprentice, companion, and master, but in a magical way. And it's imagined by a winding staircase of three, five, seven steps, which will make sense to any mason or copyist. Um, you would literally go up the staircase backwards with a knife being held to various parts of your body. And you'd take one third of the obligation, apprentice, one third of the obligation, companion, one third of the obligation, master. You get to the top, there's a trap door. They pull it and they push you off. <laughs> you fall through the staircase, down a story, into a bundle of hay. And that is like a physical way to be like, oh, the fall of man, and very visceral. Another way that organizations have done this when uh, it's either impractical to have a staircase and fall through or just dangerous is you'll have different sets of circles, which will exemplify that. Then you have the second election of Abraham in the black band. This is what we call our fourth to seventh degree. Um, various orders do this in totally different ways nowadays. Some organizations go straight to the degree. Um, some don't even use the first ones. We use both in order to try to get the most complete picture of it. Um, the election of Abraham in the black band, which is symbolized by this black apron. And I don't have it with me, forgot it, but a, uh, a black sash with a skull, three daggers, which symbolizes the work you're gonna be doing essentially. Um, you guys online can see some circles that they're working with. Um, one is the Yeheshua circle, big circle, with four little circles, Yud, He, Shin, Vav, He. As well as on the left, the daily operations of Willermose from the 1700s. It can be uh, explained that we're using some orders to jump right into four to seven, basically because that, that's already sort of occurred. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Um, one of our people here said that one reason why orders might skip the first set it's because they've already seen it through Freemasonry. But I see that there's great value in going through it again because uh, you get to see how Pasquale took the original Masonic myth and occultified it. And basically, after that first set of degrees, he goes off to a total tangent, a bit different from Freemasonry. But by starting in those first three or four, you get that foundation in classical Freemasonry. Then we have... Um, so I should clarify, in the LMS, we've already infused the first degree with Ella Cohen. We've infused the second degree with CBCS and more Ella Cohen. Third degree is pure void cardiac transmission of the real secret. So when our candidates 
go through the Yellow Cohen, they've already done the seventh degree work by the time they get here. So therefore, they don't have to redo it. What they do get is the, operation, the equinox operations. Um, and in 1942, Robert Ambalon, who was known as Sar Ortifer, hell of a name, Ortifer. <laughs> Jokes. He begins to reconstruct the Yellow Cohen, and most organizations are using his reconstructed rituals. Um, we've taken those in all its extant versions, and then new translations of the source text to make them as close as we can to the originals. Um, so he begins doing these equinox operations in France, and it's a one to three day operation, depending on how you look at it, in which every member would meet, would in their own homes, their own oratories, meet at the exact same moment, like say midnight, and do the operation together. It is essentially an exorcism of the fallen spirits uh, influence in the universe. So you go exercise Satan Bara, Beelzebub, Belphegor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's very intense. So he started off the first time they did it, the first equinox, eight members. The next equinox, 16, then 24, then 48. It just grew extremely quick, his El Khan. And as we talked about last lecture, he eventually became the head grand master of pretty much everything. And he gave it away in the 60s, 60s-ish, 70s. And that only lasted for a year, and that grandmaster gave up. So he picked it back up again, held onto it for a while, and then gave it away again. So Ambalon, we owe a lot to him for all the vast understanding of Martinism outside of Pop Coop. Um, you can see his book, Templars and the Rose Croix, pages 60 to 66, where he describes these 1942, 1944 operations. So here's a quote from the Equinox. In the name of Jesus Christ, O God and Lord, by the intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary Theotokos, Mother of God, of Saint Michael the Archangel, of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and of all the saints and supported on the sacred authority of my own ministry, I undertake to repulse the attacks and the trickery of the demonic powers with confidence. Hmm. So um, one thing we should bring up is that some people have a big paranoia about the Cohen. So they're like, demons? It's like it scares them. But it should be understood that you're not going to be working with demons until you're ready for it. Especially in the, in the OMS, you don't work with demons until after you have the RS, until after you have uh, attained your own personal integration. So you guys can see it there. Online, you guys see the original MEC certificate from the 1770s. And uh, there's a little link at the circle. Yeah, super cool. Then we have the third election of Moses in the red band. So we went blue, black, red. Um, the first part of this is the eighth degree, Grandmaster Cohen. Uh, here's a quote from that. May the cloud that covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the eternal God that filled the tabernacle fill this temple. In the name of the Lord God and the holy covenant, may the angel of the eternal one cover us with his most protective wings. May the virtue of the most high guard us and may the princess of heaven deign to assist, purify, and unite us on this day and in this place. And uh, most of the versions out there of this ritual that are being used by current modern orders are missing a very important key from this. So in ours, we now have the spirits you're supposed to use. You know, they have the names in some of them, but never the sigils. So we give them the names, the sigils, and a Kabbalistic analysis of their name. Uh, the Grand Master Cohen also gets what's called the Crescent Moon Operation, um, which is, you know, another exorcism. Basically, in this class, you're exercising yourself and everything around you. Um, a quote from that. O Kadosh, 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 Hebrew for holy. Who will allow me to return to my first essence of divine creation? Who will allow me to reinstall my spiritual virtue and strength? Who will lead me to that blessed and most holy abiding, where the Father, the living, and the dead made so many efforts to watch over me. In his goodness and willingness, he protected me against all evil on my path. Under the brightness of just one ray of his light, and the shadows could not besiege me anymore. My power, strength, and will were not withheld by any limitation. My thought dwelled like yours in eternal action. So just a little taste of what you're going through in those operations. Then we have the fourth election of Zerubbabel and the Green Band. 
which you can see online and here. Here's the apron, which is uh, very much, you'll see a very similar apron in the modern day Scottish Rite. This degree is pretty much in there, just minus the magic, just the theory. Um, and on this, we see a bridge. We see a trowel, a triangle, and the letters LDP and a sword. And that is French. <clears throat> and then on the sash, you have seven skulls on a green sash. So this represents uh, the green waters of the bridge that they're crossing over. And in this mythology, essentially, uh, just like in the Scottish Rite, you are depicting the role or the type of Zerubbabel. You are Zerubbabel going to King Cyrus, pleading to let the nation, the, uh, the nation of Israel return to its holy land, return to its home. And he comes to Cyrus, and Cyrus, he convinces him. And Cyrus makes a decree that he will let the Israelites come back, and he will assist them to rebuild the temple. Uh, so a very important part of uh, Judaic history, which has been passed on in many different rites. Um, one quote from this degree, I am Zerubbabel, prince of the line of David. May the king have mercy in our nation. May he allow us to rebuild the holy temple, to observe the sacrifices, and reconstruct that which the foreign powers and our sins have destroyed to the foundations. Um, now, this version has been used very differently in Martin's orders. Some of them have the very Masonic version. That's all they do. It's basically just it's the first version we all went through as our first test run. And it's cool. It's good history. But there's nothing magical about it. And it's just a philosophy and a history lesson. Uh, we later found magical versions with uh, real big circles, lots and lots of circles, and lots and lots of names. It's going to take an hour to draw that one. <laughs> um, so we transmit it through two stages. Night of the Orient, which is where you go through the Masonic style version that we've all been through. Um, and then the second version, Command of the Orient. So you take part one, you go home, and you do a very simple operation. Um, once you've attained the pass for that, you come back, you get part two, which we call the Command of the Orient. And that is a very Elokonan uh, ceremony. And then after that, you have a four rituals up here, four big operations, which are exorcisms. Uh, here's are some examples of this same apron in various rites. We have the French rite, uh, an Ecosse rite, I think, like an old Scottish rite on the right. And you see that there's the bridge, there's battles happening, um, destroyed temples, the rebuilding of the new temple. Here's two more versions of it. And on the right, you see that LDP with the skulls and the sword, very similar to the version we have now. And again, these aprons, they're all online. You can buy these at azothart.com. You can buy them at multiple websites in Europe. So we're not giving away any secrets by showing these. And then right here, the other reason why I felt it was okay to publish these is uh, Piers Vaughn, probably one of the most uh, critically acclaimed Masonic and Martinist historians out there, uh, he just released a new translation of Heirs of Truth. We also have our own version, but he has a new version he's publishing. And on Facebook, he has this picture of a, of a mannequin dressed as a roquois. So he's already given everyone the regalia, so it's not a secret anymore. Um, the roquois you guys can't see right now, it's basically a man in a white alb with red trim, red trim, and then he has the Master Elokon, this side, Master Elokon sash, Zerubbabel sash, Zerubbabel apron, and a red belt. Uh, so Roqua, spelled two different ways, with or without an X. Here's a quote from the Lessons of Leon, uh, Willard Rose. When the miner has had the pleasure to accept his sacrifice, he made him a junction of good spirit, a, a unification with the HGA, purifying it of all its impurities, which restores his correspondence with the divine spiritual beings and gives him the power to operate the virtues as an agent of divine faculties. The most necessary virtue for this item is, any guesses? Humility. So the Roqua degree, we're not going to talk about what happens in there other than that uh, it is the, comp the completion and the summation of the entire system. And uh, you could say, in light of certain modern day organizations, 
that it could represent the uh, tenth and eleventh images of the splendor solace, perhaps. Okay, now we're going to talk briefly about uh, how this myth good, right in time, has been perpetuated through Pasquale's students. So Pasquale died in 1774 in Saint Domingue, Haiti. Uh, he traveled to Haiti to collect, collect an inheritance, and he never returned. Um, despite that he died there, uh, he was noted to have been seen throughout the lodges of France after his death during initiation rituals, like walking around in the back, the dark shadows of the room. And I think this is probably where part of the idea of the past masters comes from, this evocation of the dead. Um, so his primary students, after Pasquale died, he was the charismatic, creative, intuitive teacher. And without his inspiration, the order just began to devolve. And by 1791, it was basically dissolving. Um, but it didn't die the way some people think. Um, we have knowledge that it's only been published like once ever, and even they didn't put the whole thing together. We have knowledge that several of those high-grade Masonic organizations from Germany, from Sweden, from France, bound together in 1791-92 and formed a new organization, which has never stopped initiating. Um, however, also, we have Willard Rose. In 1778, he took over the Strict Observance, Strict Observance Templier, which was ran by uh, Baron von Hoot of Germany, which was a high-grade Masonic system based on the mythos of the Templars. He took it over, revised it, and created the RER, the Rectified Stratus Rite, Rectified uh, right rectifé, right écossé rectifié, the precursor to the modern-day Scottish rite. That had three degrees, apprentice, companion, master mason, with a fourth capstone degree, Scottish master St. Andrew. The first is called blue masonry, the last is called green masonry. And that's where it ended, unless you were invited to the secret inner order, which was the CBCS. That was called white masonry, because the temple is white. The fifth degree of squire novice, basically a knight's uh, Handmaiden, a knight's uh, lackey. And then the sixth degree of CBCS, which is Beneficent Knight of the Holy City. You were knighted basically as a Templar. Um, again, people thought that's where it stopped, unless you knew about the secret, secret, inner, inner, double sub Rosa order, which was the seventh and eighth degrees of Profess Knight and Grand Profess Knight. Um, those two degrees, their lectures have been published for the past like 70 years. You can find them online if you know what you're looking for. Um, and in those, he basically reveals to his Masons, this became the official French hybrid masonry, by the way, it became mainstream grand lodge system. He reveals in those last two degrees that I've been preparing you to do Cohen work. And those two lectures are a distillation of reintegration of beings. And I say distillation, but it's still like 60 pages. Like it's still really big and heavy. But he basically transmits the full Pasquale myth and never let it die. And all, once you see that, you can go back to the first degree of the RER and see that he was implanting little seeds of the Cohen in the number of candles, the regalia, the prayers, et cetera, et cetera. And it's rumored that at the eighth degree, you would actually begin initiation in the Cohen proper and start doing ceremonial magic. That is a rumor. I'm not sure if I can confirm that. Um, now, each one of these past masters transmit in their own ways. He did it through that. He also wrote what he called the Lessons of Lyon, which just happened to be 10 lessons about Pasquale's number system and his myth. Then we have San Martin. San Martin also had a ten, set of 10 lessons called the Lessons of Versailles, subtitled 10 Instructions to Men of Desire. Um, in that, we have these diagrams that look a lot like that. And he basically, in 10 lessons, goes through the Pasquale number system and talks about the myth. So these ideas that Saint Martin threw away the Yellow Cohen is complete rubbish. Now, he did prefer an inward way. He did uh, simplify things, but he never stopped working the philosophy and the theory of the Cohen. He was always teaching it. His books, errors in, well, we'll get to that in a second. So on this diagram, you guys can see the top. There's that I inside of a circle, or a one inside of a circle, like we're talking about the number system, God. We have a triangle with a three. Then at the bottom, we have a three, set of three circles with a downward point triangle. So that's an initiatory circle. And then we have this diagram of this in a simplified form. So he kept passing it on. His first book, Errors in Truth, um, 
very veiled gave them over Smith. His later books became more and more unveiled until near his death he just threw it out there for everyone. Key texts are the stanzas and origin of the destiny of man, wisdom's instruction, ten prayers, and man, his true nature, and spiritual ministry, which in my opinion is his best book. Um, all of which we give to you in your first degree. So, yeah. That is his best book, in my opinion. It's divided into three sections. I think it's God, Nature, and Man are the three sections. And he just lays it out there for everyone to see. Uh, here's a list of what I call beginner Elocone resources for you guys online to go read. Reintegration of Beings, Get the Campenhout Version. Le Manuscript d'Alger, sorry, it's in French. Uh, Les Origines, a bunch of other French shit. So check it out if you want to le learn more about this. These are all texts that you can find easily online. Now about the OMS, we currently have temples operating in Austin, Texas, Stockholm, Sweden, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, Cincinnati, Ohio, and a new fifth temple, which we're not disclosing its location, but it's in Europe. Um, we also have circles in Dallas, Houston, Colorado, California, and Germany. Um, the GCSI, the Grand Council, operates out of the Mother Temple here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we prefer close proximity to a fully operating temple for candidates, but certain exceptions can be made. Um, for individuals who are dedicated to coming here for their initiations at least once a year, coming to our international gathering we hold every fall, every September, and especially for certain uh, Martinus SIs and SIIs. So um, upcoming public events. We've got next month, every month we're going to have one lecture on a Sunday around this time. So Sunday, October 15th from noon to 2 right here and online will be part 3 about Willer Mose, the Templars, and the CBCS. So just like this dissected the Cohen, we'll now dissect the CBCS. Part 4 is Sunday, November 12th from 4 to 6 p.m., a little later in the day. Um, that is going to be all about San Martin, the way of the heart. And then part five is going to be on the Gnostic Church. And that is Sunday, December 10th from 3 to 5. Now that's going to talk about formation of the French Gnostic Church, the various treaties and accordances signed by, between Eglise Gnostique Universelle and the Martinist Order. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, the training of the minor ordinations and give you avenues if you want to seek those ordinations. So for further information, resources, go to martinism.net. Uh, we prefer serious inquiries only. Um, if you're d dedicated to this work, contact us. If not, then just do theory. Wait until you are ready, OK? Um, this work is not for everyone. It takes a very unique individual to go through these whole processes. And you don't want to start something you're not going to finish. So for more information, go to there. Email the uh, Grand Master or the Grand Chancellor to get uh, a bunch of documents, digital, uh, that include our public